Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking about food and why it's important. Um, I'm not going to be talking so much about implementation and sort of behavior change methods and, and other things. Um, there, there are a lot of vendors here and a lot of conversations about that. I'm going to be talking about why it's important and what are some of the big reasons uh, and big challenges and big new discoveries that, that, we've, that we uh, uh, face. So why focus on nutrition? Well, I think it's uh, fair to say that we actually have a global nutrition crisis. Um, this is truly a crisis, and it's a pretty quiet crisis. People talk about climate change, people talk about war, people talk about prejudice, people talk about poverty, and yet very few people are talking about the, the global nutrition crisis. This is now the number one cause of poor health in the United States. It exceeds tobacco smoking as the number one preventable cause of, of disease and illness. So for people interested in wellness, nutrition must be the very, very top priority above any other priority. It's the number one cause of poor health globally, uh, exceeding all other causes of, of uh, poor health around the world. Um, it's incredibly important for healthcare costs. So in the United States, as everyone knows, almost one in five dollars in the economy is spent on healthcare. Almost a thousand dollars per year is spent on healthcare for every man, woman, and child in the United States, and that exceeds most people's budgets for, uh, you know, uh, uh, their their grocery shopping and other things that that, that they may do. Uh, and it's it's impossible. It drives me crazy that Congress has been debating health care, and even you know, eight years ago when President Obama debated health care, food and nutrition wasn't brought up. It's the number one cause of poor health, and it's missing from the health care system. Is it any wonder we have runaway costs, we have an obesity epidemic, we have a diabetes epidemic? Health and nutrition is not taught in medical school. It's not in the electronic health record. There are very few reimbursement guidelines for nutrition in the health care system, and there's no quality metrics or guidelines for nutrition. So think about that. Think about the irony here. The number one cause of poor health is missing from our healthcare system, and that's why we have runaway costs. This is, of course, crucial for government but businesses, uh, excuse me, for government budgets, but also crucial for private businesses and economic growth. Warren Buffett just a few months ago said that the major challenge that the U.S. businesses face is healthcare costs, rising healthcare costs. Many of you in this room, how many people here have self-employed or, or pay a lot for their employees, right? You know this is going up double digits almost every year. This is the major challenge to uh, many businesses, and nutrition is the core of why costs are going up. Uh, this is also crucial for sustainability and climate change. The number one uh, uh, use of water on the planet uh, is agriculture. 70% of all water use is agriculture. 90% of tropical deforestation is due to agriculture and how we grow our food. The oceans are stressed due, due to fishing. And even climate change, people think about cars and gas, but do you know that just methane from beef production has the same uh, uh, CO2 equivalents, the same uh, warming effects of all the cars, planes, trains, automobiles, all our transportation on the planet combined. That's just methane from, from beef production. So whether it's climate change, water use, land use, uh, or the oceans, this is really the number one issue for, for climate change. Food is also a major issue for national security. So people often don't link food and national security, but in fact, there's a long, long history of this. So the birth of the RDAs, the recommended daily allowances that are on the backs of all the packages that say the percentage of this and percentage of that, the birth of the RDAs was in 1941. Uh, does anybody know the name of the conference that, that gave rise to the RDAs? It was, it was ordered by President Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to have this conference. It was the National Nutrition Conference on Defense. The president knew we were going to war, and he said, what does the population need? What does the population need to be healthy to go to war? That led to the RDAs. The birth of the school lunch program, does anybody know the national school lunch program when that was, when that was uh, formed? 1945, an act of Congress, because during the war, during the draft, the number one reason that recruits could not qualify was, was malnutrition, poor nutrition. So they created the school lunch program for national security. And now today, there's a group called Mission Readiness. You should look up their website. It's over 700 retired admirals and generals. And they have said that nutrition and, and obesity is the number one threat or a major threat to national security. The, the, the number one medical reason 
that otherwise qualified recruits can't, can't uh, qualify for the military is overweight and obesity. And two thirds of our active duty forces are overweight and obese. So it's a major issue for national security. And also for disparities, um, I would say that food is not the, the cause of disparities. Still education, poverty, prejudice are still the, the, the major challenges for disparities. But, but poor eating, it uh, acts in a vicious cycle to worsen disparities. And so kids can't get good breakfast and don't study. They can't concentrate in school. Their parents get sick and ill and can't keep jobs. And in middle-income countries and low-income countries where there's not insurance, or even in our country, for people who are uninsured, a major medical event can devastate the family's uh, income and put them into poverty. So health and well-being, health care, government budgets, private business, sustainability, national security, disparities. I know of no other issue that touches all of these things with that level of depth. And so for me, it's just shocking. Whoever is going to be your congressman or your senator, whoever is going to be president of any country in the world, that nutrition and food system isn't one of the major topics that's discussed and debated is just shocking, right? And it's just, and it, it explains why we are where we are today. But the wonderful thing is we have advances in nutrition science to, to begin to address this. So at Tufts, at the Friedman School, the name of our school is the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. So we study the science of, of how food influences health and, and the, the planet. And we also study the science of policy. And I use the word policy loosely to mean systems changes, systems changes in work sites, systems changes in healthcare systems, systems changes in governments. Uh, and so this intersection is crucial because if you don't have science and policy together, you're going to have bad policy or you're going to have science that's not translated. And neither of those is very effective. And so what I want to talk about today is how we translate what we know about food into good, good and sound policy. Uh, so this is just one figure I'm going to show you um, about uh, what I discussed earlier. This is a graph showing the causes of death in the United States in one year. And you can see on the bottom axis, there's hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, let me see if I have a, I don't know if I have a laser pointer. I don't think I do. Um, so along the bottom of the axis are hundreds of thousands of deaths. And the colors are different types of deaths. Blue are chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancers. You can see the number one cause of death in the United States is diet, as I mentioned, exceeding tobacco smoking. And if you look down the list among the top six or seven causes, most of those are also influenced by diet independently. And so diet is, is by far the single biggest issue we have to think about for health. Um, and also the public, you know, interestingly, while in Washington, D.C., there's not many people talking about this, the public now get this. I've been doing research and, and seeing patients and talking about nutrition for about 20 years. And the pace of attention to food in our food system is incredible the last few years. It's almost exponential this growth in attention. This is especially true among young people. So how many people have kids who've come home, teenagers, and said, I'm not going to eat this, or I'm going to change this, or I'm going to eat sustainably, or I'm going to be a vegan, or I'm going to go gluten-free, or, or parents, young parents who start thinking about their kids. The public absolutely gets that the food system is broken and is making them sick. But they're at the same time unbelievably confused, right? There's a cacophony of conflicting information voices, media, blogs, books, and nobody actually knows who to trust. And what this leads to is what I call nutritional nihilism, which is, well, I'll eat, quote, everything in moderation, which just means I'll eat whatever I want and my diet is fine, right? And so, so this confusion is, is a problem, but the passion is something that's positive and we have to harness. So this is kind of what government is talking about in our policies right now, and this is what the public is talking about. Government and policymakers are still focusing a lot on nutrients. They're still talking a lot about fat. They're still talking a lot about calories. They're still talking a lot about saturated fat, cholesterol, added sugar. Um, and I saw Kind Bars uh, here in the, in the booth. I know Daniel Lebetsky, the founder of Kind Bars, and we corresponded with his team a couple of years ago because did people hear the FDA actually sent a, a violation letter to Kind Bars because they were marketing themselves as healthy and using the word healthy in their advertising. The FDA sent them a formal violations letter, said you can't market yourself as healthy. And they said, why? And they said, you have too much fat in your products. And they said, well, our products are 80, 90% nuts and 
nuts are 80% fat, so healthy fat. So of course we're high in fat. We're high in healthy fats from nuts. And to their credit, the FDA, peti the, the Kind Bars petitioned the FDA and said, you know, the dietary guidelines say to eat nuts. And we've had two of our faculty members on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. And they promoted those guidelines. So, you know, your violation letter is, is, not, is not consistent with the dietary guidelines. And to their credit, the FDA said, you're right. And said, we need to revise our guidelines. And they're in that process now. But still, the government, that's just one example. The government is really focused on those things. The public, on the other hand, is focused on this stuff. Clean labels, ingredients I can understand, gluten-free, organic, local, paleo, low-carb, vegetarian, vegan. Well, I would submit that almost everything on this list is actually not that important for health, on both sides. And so here's where the intersection of science and policy is crucial. We have policymakers and the public making decisions based on 20-year-old science, 30-year-old science. That would be like going to your doctor and saying, I want the absolutely best treatment you have from 30 years ago, right? Or being here and saying, well, I don't want to know what you're doing now for personalized nutrition. I want to know what you're doing 30 years ago for my worksite wellness program, right? That's what the public and policymakers are doing. Well, the public, not so much based on 30 years ago. They're, they're doing it based on just kind of the book of the moment or the fad of the moment. So this isn't really, none of these are actually major, major priorities. So what's wonderful about being in this field What's really exciting and what really makes me actually incredibly optimistic for the future, this is not a gloom and doom talk, this is a talk that we can actually address this, is the explosion of nutrition science. So one of the questions I get all the time is why does nutrition science change? You know, you used to say don't eat butter, eat margarine, then you said margarine has trans fats, they're bad for you, so eat butter again, but now maybe margarines are okay again. What about chocolate? What about coffee? Right? So, so I get asked that all the time, they say, and, and my answer is sci all sciences change. Physics changes, cardiology changes, every science has changed just as rapidly as, and radically as nutrition science. The difference for nutrition science is it's in the public eye, right? Everybody talks about it. There's a change, there's a change in the science, there's an update, there's an evolution. Everybody talks about it, it gets attention. I can give you example after example in cardiology of ways that we've changed cardiology practice, sometimes radically, and it's not in the public eye, so people don't suspect cardiologists of not being you know, good scientists. As just one example, when Theodore Roosevelt had a heart attack in the, in the I think, 50s, I'm going to get my dates wrong when he was president, um, what was his physical activity prescription? Anybody can guess? What was his physical activity prescription when he had a heart attack? Six weeks of bed rest. Six weeks he couldn't get out of bed. He was in Colorado when he had his heart attack. So they put him, they took an entire floor of the hospital, University of Colorado, and they moved the White House to Colorado for six weeks. And the, the other doctors thought his doctor was being aggressive, that six weeks was too soon, right? And now we know, of course, after a heart attack, you need cardiac rehab, you need to get up, you need to move, you need to... So that's a huge change in our science, but it's not publicly discussed. Science is advanced, nutrition science is advanced because we have incredible advances and new, new research. And so what this graph shows you is the number of scientific publications in every decade from 1960 to now. If you look up diet and cardiovascular disease, diet and diabetes, diet and obesity, you can see in every decade the science is doubling with the next decade. And orange is just the first half of this decade. So we're on pace to double again. So most of what we know, most of what I'm going to talk about we've really kind of clarified since 2000, right? It's just brand new cutting edge science that isn't really, really out there. And that's what's really exciting is we're really moving toward understanding what we need to know. So I'm gonna talk about five lessons, five things that I think we know now that we've learned where there's a lot left to learn, but the five key things that we know. So the first thing is to think about foods and diet quality and obesity. Obesity is what everybody is thinking about um, when they think about food, and there's a problem with that, and that's lesson number two, but I'll get to that. But for lesson number one, obesity is about more than calories. It's not about calorie control. It's not about portion size control. It's not about energy balance. It's about eating better food. Trying to address obesity by counting calories and, and watching your portion sizes and reducing you know, fat in your foods to reduce calories. It's like trying to hold your breath, right? 
your conscious willpower will let you hold your breath for a certain amount of time, and eventually all of your unconscious reflexes will take over and you will have to breathe again. Trying to lose weight or restrict your caloric intake by eating less of foods consciously is the same. It works for a few months. For some people, it might work for a year. But eventually, if you're not eating good quality food, all the physiologic mechanisms that drive hunger, craving, higher glucose, higher uh, uh, adrenaline, multiple other adipokines and hormones will take over and people will gain weight again, often even more than when they started before. So obesity is not about diet quantity. It's not about calories. It's about the quality of the food that we eat, long term. Short term, if you want to lose weight in three months, of course, count your calories. If you cut your calories, you will lose weight. You can go on a paleo diet, a low carb diet, a low fat diet. You can go on a gummy bear diet. You will lose weight, right? But eventually, you will fail. And so it's really not about calories. It's about how foods affect our hunger, our fullness, our glucose and insulin and hormonal responses, processes like fat synthesis in the liver, brain reward and craving, the gut microbiome, and even the body's uh, uh, energy metabolism. There's now several trials in people showing that the quality of the food you eat affects your energy out, it affects how much energy you burn. Think about how profound that is. So really, lesson number one is it's about more than calories. And all calories are not created equal. So this is a study, and I'm just going to walk you through it quickly, just to one study that, that, that highlights this. What this study, uh, what we looked at is long-term weight gain when people increased intake of different foods. Not weight gain over a few months, weight gain over years. We followed 120,000 people in three different studies for up to 24 years. And we said, as they changed their diet over years, how do these changes in food relate to changes in their weight? And there's three different studies we looked at because we wanted to be sure we were getting the right answer. So each of those colors is a different study. And as you can see, the results are really consistent, similar effects for, for the different foods across the different studies. And what we looked at is increased intake of all of these foods. What happened when people increased intake of all of these foods? Now, if it was just about calories, if you increased intake of all of these foods, you should gain weight, right? Proportional to their calories. And so all the bars, which is the weight change every four years, should be on this side, right? Should be positive. But that's not what we found. We found some foods were clearly linked to weight gain the more you ate. Potato chips, potatoes and fries, even baked potatoes, um, sweets and desserts, refined grains, meats were linked to weight gain, and um, among drinks, sugar, sweet, and beverages. So with the exception of meats and butter was modestly linked to weight gain, it's mostly carbohydrates. It's mostly starch and sugar. Not just sugar, starch and sugar was linked to weight gain. And then we found a series of foods, cheese, low-fat milk, whole-fat milk, uh, that were not linked to weight gain at all. The more people ate, they didn't gain weight. They ate more cheese, they didn't gain weight. They had low-fat milk or whole-fat milk, they didn't gain weight. And of course, this is America. These are Americans in these studies. So this is not a little cutting board of brie and some walnuts and, and some, right? This is American cheese, right? This is how Americans eat hamburgers, deli sandwiches, right? They're not gaining weight. And then we found the magic foods, right? These foods, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and yogurt. The more people ate, the bigger their portion sizes, the less weight they gained. So as we wrote in this paper, which was published now uh, six years ago, still new science, you know, we don't think that these foods violate the laws of thermodynamics. We think that obesity is complicated, that there's many, many mechanisms which we understand now that regulate long-term, over months and months and years, how we manage our weight, how we manage our calories, how our metabolism works, how our brains re respond to food, to food. And different foods can help those mechanisms, make them work a little bit better, can hurt those mechanisms, or kind of be neutral for those mechanisms. The worst is starch and sugar. Over many, many years, if you eat more starch and sugar, do your best, try to keep your calories down. Those mechanisms, unconsciously, you're just gonna eat a little bit more. Not a lot more, 20 calories, 10 calories more a day, five calories more a day. Over years, that adds up. Other foods like cheese and low-fat milk and whole-fat milk seem to be pretty neutral. Your bodies kind of account for those calories automatically. You eat more, you eat less, you replace those calories automatically. And then foods like vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and yogurt 
they help those mechanisms. They help those mechanisms so that you actually lose weight long term the more you eat. Now, I would have predicted vegetables, nuts, whole grains, and fruits on this list. They're all packed with bioactive phytochemicals. They have fiber. They are slowly digested. So they all kind of made sense. But yogurt jumped out at us a little bit. We weren't expecting yogurt. Nobody had ever shown this before, that yo more yogurt, less weight gain. And yogurt, you know, from a nutrient profile perspective, is not that different from milk or cheese. So what was different about yogurt? What did we hypothesize might be different about yogurt? This audience, someone's got to know this. The bacteria, right? There's active probiotics in yogurt. And we, we hypothesize maybe yogurt interacts with the microbiome. And something about the yogurt microbiome interaction had not even really been studied six years ago, what the potential impact could be on obesity. Since we published this paper, there's been at least a dozen human trials and multiple animal studies showing that indeed the probiotics in yogurt interact with the microbiome, interact with the gut inflammatory system, interact with the gut uh, immune system to regulate weight. Now, I wouldn't say all of that science is conclusive and we know the pathways and we know what's going on, but if you put it all together, it's clear to me that there's yogurt and probiotics are important for weight gain. So it's not about calories. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is it's not about obesity. <laughs> so in the 70s, we were so worried about blood cholesterol and heart attacks in middle-aged men that we focused on a low-fat diet. We said, well, if people eat a low-fat diet, their cholesterol will go down, and that's the big nutritional problem in the country. We saw where that took us, right? That wasn't a really successful experiment. Now we've switched from focusing so much on blood lipids and cholesterol. Everybody's so concerned about obesity, they forget that obesity is a minor pathway for the effects of diet on health. So I really want to emphasize that. I want to say it again. Obesity is a minor pathway for the effect of your food on your health. It is a pathway. Of course, it's important. It can influence your health. But diet is not synonymous with weight. And, and I have seen in doctor's offices, um, around dinner tables, in worksite wellness programs, people talk about diet to talk about weight. That is a huge mistake. Whatever your weight, physical activity is important, right? Whatever your weight, quitting smoking is important. Whatever your weight, a healthy diet is important. So if you're overweight or you're normal weight and you have a bad diet, you're dramatically worsening your health. And if you're overweight or you're normal weight and you have a good diet, you're dramatically improving your health without weight loss. So all of these pathways that are listed here, there's you know, some medical sort of lingo there, but there's so many pathways whereby foods affect health. So don't think about diet and obesity as synonymous, right? We do want to target obesity as one thing. We also want to target blood cholesterol and blood pressure and, and brain and the microbiome. We want to target a lot of things for good health. But diet is, is about much, much more than obesity. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples of, of why you know, we have to think about more than just uh, uh, obesity and, and, and uh, uh, cholesterol. So this is a large study uh, in Europe from, called the EPIC cohort. They followed 340,000 Europeans for many, many years from eight countries. And they watched over time as these, among these 340,000 Europeans, 12,000 new cases of diabetes developed. And they looked to see what predicted the onset of diabetes, adjusting for all other behavioral and lifestyle factors that they could think of. And what this graph shows is the risk, the relative risk. So one means neutral, higher above one means higher risk, below one means lower risk of diabetes for quintiles of consumption of these, of these foods, fifths of consumption, from the lowest quintile to the top quintile. And they found that milk, milk was kind of neutral. As you can see, it kind of is all around one. Whether you were in the lowest group or the highest group of milk intake, your risk of diabetes was around one, which is a relative risk that's neutral. On the other hand, yogurt and cheese, the more you ate yogurt and cheese, the lower the risk of diabetes independent of the calories, independent of other dietary risk factors. Yogurt, we'd already studied and, and the year before and linked yogurt to weight loss. And so that is a plausible mechanism for how yogurt could be linked to weight loss. This is one of the first earliest studies to link cheese to low risk of diabetes, though. So that's quite interesting. And while I don't think the mechanisms are clear, che cheese is fermented. And there's grow growing evidence about potential benefits of fermentation and fermented foods. 
Uh, and in fact, in Europe, there's enough people who drink fermented milk. You know, it comes fermented milk is popular in some countries that they separated out and looked at fermented milk. And when they looked at fermented milk, it looks just like cheese. More fermented milk, low risk of diabetes. So I don't think this evidence is yet conclusive that yogurt and cheese, low risk of diabetes. I think it's suggestive. But this is just one example of that we have to think way beyond weight when we think about foods and we think about health. Um, this is another example, also an example from dairy, which I think is quite interesting. This is a study which looked, compared whipped cream and butter in a randomized trial in about 80 people followed for eight, week, eight weeks who were randomized to have 15% of their calories from butter or 15% of their calories from whipped cream every morning with scones and jam. So you would, you know, which group would you want to be randomized to, right? And of course, the participants were very compliant, right? They loved getting free butter or free whipped cream. So they ate everything they gave them. And at the end of the study, they measured their blood cholesterol levels. Well, the reason they did this study is for something called milk fat globule membrane. So whipped cream and butter, whipping cream and butter, of course, nutrient-wise, almost exactly the same. They have the same fat, the same saturated fat, the same nutrients. I mean, it's almost exactly the same. The difference is that the butter was homogenized, which destroys something called milk fat globule membrane. The, the whipped cream was lightly pasteurized, but it was not homogenized. So the milk fat globule membrane was intact. And that's what these scanning uh, micrographs show is the green shows that there's these phospholipid fatty acids that are around the natural fat of dairy fat. Whoops, I keep going ahead. Is, is what's shown in green. So the natural dairy fat should be in big clumps with this green layer of active fatty acids called phospholipids around it. When you homogenize dairy fat, you get rid of that green. Now the reason these investigators study this, this was just published last year, is that 50 years ago, 40 years ago, some people had looked at these membranes for infants and wondered if in mo mother's milk these membranes were important and they'd shown indeed that these fatty acids that are in this milk fat globule membrane are bioactive and they have effects on the infant. And that was, and that was one of the reasons they thought mother's milk was more important and healthier than, than formula. So in this randomized trial, what did they find? At the end of the eight weeks, when they gave the, the participants butter, they found all the predictable changes in blood cholesterol, right? More LDL cholesterol, lower good cholesterol, and so on. When they gave people the same amount of calories and fat and saturated fat in the, in the whipped cream with the intact globule membrane, no changes in cholesterol at all, right? So just, again, I'm not going to go out and tell you to go give whipped cream to your employees, but it just highlights how interesting and how complicated food is and how we have to think about much, much more than fat or nutrients or, or calories. So that's lesson number two. Lesson number three is I think what we've learned, as I've mentioned a couple times now, but I'll, I'll focus in on, is that to think about what we need to focus on, the strongest evidence is not about nutrients. It's not about isolated uh, nutrients. Uh, it's about foods and food patterns. We have to think about increasing healthy foods, not nutrients. Um, and uh, in the, I'll just quickly talk about this. This is a list of foods that we linked to, to deaths in the United States. Processed meats, we estimated each year in the United States, 58,000 Americans die from eating hot dogs and other processed meats due to diabetes and cardiovascular disease and other obesity-related diseases. Numbers get thrown around all the time. So just to put that in perspective, 35,000 Americans die each year from car accidents. Okay, so more Americans are estimated to die each year from eating hot dogs and processed meats, twice as many almost as car accidents. Um, and so here, this is a list of where I think the science is for the priorities. We should be eating more good foods, emphasizing the good, fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables, vegetable oils, whole grains, beans, and yogurt. There's kind of neutral foods that are kind of in the middle. Cheese is maybe a little bit higher because, it, as I said, it may reduce diabetes. Unprocessed red meats are a little bit lower because they seem to modestly increase diabetes. And neutral is okay, right? We can't always be eating good food. Neutral is okay. But there's stuff that's really, really bad. It's mostly starch and sugar. And there's a lot of focus on sugar these days, but not enough focus on starch. There's five times as much starch in the food system as added sugar. So think of starch as the hidden sugar. Right? This is really what's in the food system. Processed meats, high sodium foods, and industrial trans fat. Um, and then, you know, so trying to focus on nutrients to make food decisions is incredibly misleading. And these are just some examples. 
Turkey sausage links, 60% less fat. They're not any healthier. They're highly processed, loaded with sodium, loaded with nitrates. Has anybody ever bought a nitrate-free processed meat, bacon or hot dog? Right? Does anybody know that that's a complete lie? Right? Do people know this? Look on the ingredient of every processed meat that says nitrate-free. What will you find? Does anybody know on the ingredients list? Celery juice. Somebody, I heard it. Somebody knows. Celery juice is loaded with nitrates. If they put celery juice, instead of taking nitrates and putting in, it's loaded with nitrates, but by law, they don't have to say it has nitrates. They can actually say it's nitrate-free. Every single meat in the United States has nitrates and, and sodium in it, so that's clearly unhealthy. Fat-free chocolate milk, right? That's actually allowed in schools, and whole, whole fat plain milk is banned in schools right now. So if you have, does anybody have a kid in public school? Right? Your children cannot buy plain whole milk. It is not allowed by the US government, but they can buy chocolate skim milk. Right? And that only makes sense if you count calories and count fat rather than thinking about the healthfulness of the product. Baked potato chips and, and fat-free salad dressing are two other great examples. Um, what are the three ingredients in a potato chip? Potatoes, oil, and salt. Right? And of those, what's the one healthy ingredient? The vegetable oil, it's canola oil, it's soybean oil, unsaturated fats, extremely good for you. Starch and salt, not so good for you. So you're taking a product with one good ingredient and two bad ones and you're lowering the good ingredient, right? So I'm not saying potato chips are a health food, but if you're gonna eat potato chips, get the highest fat potato chip you can find, <laughs> right? Really, that's a healthier choice. Uh, and then fat-free salad dressing, I'll just leave to think about and wonder what could possibly be in something that, that by definition should have oil in it and is fat free? Um, and so I, I'm, I'm running out of time. I want to leave time for questions. We have about 10 minutes left, but I want to leave time for questions, so I'll go a little bit quicker. Lesson number four, which is crucial for this audience, is that it's about much, much more than education and individual choice and individual free will. We are not going to address people's behavior. We are not going to improve the food system through telling people you know, how to eat healthier. Right? That helps. I'm not saying it doesn't help. Done effectively, done appropriately, done through no novel technologies and behavior change systems and, and group systems, it helps, but it is not enough. There are so many influences on a person's choice and, and what they choose beyond individual choice, from cultural to environment to government to global. So we have to think about systems changes. Um, and I think from the evidence, my summary of the evidence, of what I think are the best buy policies, the best buy systems changes are on this slide. It goes from government taxes and subsidies to normalize the true cost of foods, to better use food stamps, SNAP, the, the, the program that one in six Americans are on, to incentivize industry to make healthier foods, all kinds of things the government should do with, with economic incentives. Schools, schools are actually getting much better, so with the exception of the whole fat, uh, a low fat milk problem. The school lunch program is much, much better than it was following Let's Move and, and the First Lady Obama's efforts. We really hope that the current administration doesn't roll that back, but there's still room to go. Work sites, right? That's a, a big area of interest here. Cafeteria nudges, um, uh, behavioral changes, changing the location of what's sold in cafeterias, putting green, red light traffic labels. All of those things have been shown to be effective. Cafeteria behavioral economics nudges. Changing the standards, changing, having voluntary standards for your workplace, what can actually be available in vending machines and stores. Very, very effective in randomized trials. Healthy food incentives, giving people uh, either gamification incentives like competitions, prizes, trips, you know, uh, group competitions, or just cash back. Nutra Savings, which is, uh, I think, one of the sponsors here, and they have, I think they gave the scores for the for the table, Nutra Savings is a program where they give cash back to the employee for buying healthier food. The average benefit, I think, is about $9 per month, but that $9 is enough for people to think about and, and uh, eat, eat healthier. Um, and then using novel technology, where this is in its infancy, I think we're starting to learn about novel technology. A key message here is the novel technology has to be linked to the right diet priorities, right? If the no novel technology is used to send people to low-fat diets and baked potato chips and fat-free salad dressing, or calorie counting and willpower, it's not going to be very effective. So it has to have the right technologies. But there's a lot of stuff that can be done in work sites. And uh, healthcare systems, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I mean, it is still, as a physician, as a cardiologist, I believe in the healthcare system. We need it. But 
It is the greatest irony and the saddest thing I can think of that the number one cause of poor health is missing from our healthcare system, essentially missing from our healthcare system. So there's a lot to be done in the healthcare system. From a government perspective, the government should regulate additives. There's no reason not to regulate additives. Um, trans fat, salt, and sugar. Trans fat has been mostly eliminated in the United States. The Food and Drug Administration said it's not generally regarded as safe. They haven't banned it, but they just said you can't use it without showing that it's safe, which essentially makes it unusable. They need to follow up with salt and sugar. Marketing to children, uh, First Amendment issues, but, but would be important. And, and we need effective labeling if the labeling is about the right priorities. I don't want to see a label that focuses on calories alone. I don't want to see a label that focuses on fat, right? I want to see a label that focuses on the overall quality of the food. And the nutrition research coming from academics, we need continued research. Um, lesson number five, the last one, is that all of this is complicated and the public and employees and people in healthcare plans are confused and policymakers are confused and if you really want to address this, it's not straightforward, right? You really have to understand the complexities of how food influences the body. You have to be able to answer questions that will come up. It, tobacco is relatively easy to address, right? People who smoke, they should go to smoking cessation. Uh, people who don't smoke, keep them off smoking. Physical activity, complicated, but still relatively straightforward. You can give people incentives, gym, gym memberships, behavioral breaks, uh, a Fitbit, you know, other tracking monitors, relatively easy to assess. Healthcare screenings, immunization, all of those things have behavioral challenges, but are relatively easy to address. Nutrition, as soon as you start having a focus on food, people are gonna start asking you, should I be eating breakfast? Should I graze or should I have three meals? Should I be using coconut oil? What about bone broth, right? What about vitamin D supplements, right? And who is prepared to answer those questions and always be up to date? It's very complicated. So I think that it's important to have credible science. And, and I'm gonna mention that the reason I'm actually here and linked to this is because we partnered with John Hancock in their Vitality program, which is a really cutting edge program that actually rewards life insurance clients for wellness. It's a wellness program for life insurance clients. They actually, they give people a free Apple Watch, and then if they get their steps, they don't have to pay for it. If they don't get their steps, they pay $10 a month. But if they get their steps, they, they, they don't have to pay for it. And that $10 a month, they, they do their steps, right? They give them uh, webinars and counseling and newsletters. And then they give them the NutraSavings platform, which ranks their foods, rates their foods, and they pay them cash back. And when John Hancock first told me this, they're linked to about 16,000 grocery stores in the country. So when the person goes and shops and buys healthier foods, they get up to $30 cash back uh, per month, um, up to, am I doing the math right? Excuse me, up to $600, $50 per month, up to $600 per year cash back. And when I first asked John Hancock, I said, oh, so you partnered with the grocery stores and you guys split that or you, know, you shared? They said, no, we pay that. So John Hancock is willing to give their life insurance clients $600 cash per person for healthier eating because they've done the math and they will save money. So what, what, what the reason we got involved with John Hancock is as soon as they started to launch their nutrition component, they realized this is incredibly complicated and we've partnered with John Hancock to give them credible science. And so this is the, the plug, but the plug, we're a nonprofit. This is the plug for better health. We have a booth that we set up exactly, actually right opposite me, Bill Dean, our, our director of strategic partnerships is there, talking about how we can help worksite wellness program, health insurance programs, life insurance programs, get credible science into their programs. We have the Tufts Health and Nutrition Letter, which is an amazing monthly newsletter. We have a fantastic weight loss program, a worksite wellness program that uses all the science I talked about to retrain the brain so that people unconsciously crave healthy foods instead of craving unhealthy foods and has been shown in randomized trials to be extremely effective for sustained weight loss. Um, we, our faculty do webinars, our faculty uh, do other, other uh, key things. And so we wanna be a credible partner to move the food system toward uh, health and make sure that everything that both the vendors here and the employers here are doing is credible and based on sound science. So I'm just gonna close with an example. One of the things I always get asked about at the end of my talk is well, what about food industry, right? Aren't we fighting the food industry? Aren't they just like big, big tobacco? And you know, we're, we're, we just can't win. So I think there are a lot of analogies between big tobacco and big food. They use a lot of the same tactics. So big food has used denial, deception, lobbying, 
hardball tactics. They co-opt groups like the NAACP and other minority groups and anti-hunger groups. A lot of the tactics are the same. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I think the analogy isn't perfect because with tobacco, it's a fight to the death. There's only one product. The tobacco company you know, knows it's bad for you, and, and there's, there's no other option. With food, there's enormous potential to make healthier foods, make a profit, and everybody wins. And so, and food industry gets this. Again, I think Kind Bars is a good example. I don't prefer packaged foods, but if I'm gonna have a packaged snack and I'm in an airport and the fruit cup doesn't look so appetizing, Kind Bars is a, is a great choice. There's lots of examples of companies trying to do the right thing. So I think a better example than tobacco is cars. Think about cars and think it's a product we all have to use, but that has dangers. And so this is a graph of the incredible public health success that the CDC declared one of the top five public health successes of the last century in car safety. Blue shows you the number of deaths in the United States per million vehicle miles traveled, VMT. For every million vehicle miles traveled, there was a 90% reduction in deaths from car accidents in the 20th century. That's a massive public health success. Pretty quiet public health success, but car accidents have gone from the number one cause of death among people less than 40 to I don't even know if it's in the top 10 anymore. Right? A huge public health success. How was this done? Right? Was it done through apps and group therapy sessions and behavioral counseling and driving guidelines and focusing on the driver? Is that all we did is focus on the driver? No, of course not. It was done through a multi-component approach that addressed the driver, but more importantly addressed the product, addressed the environment, and addressed the culture. Right? We dramatically changed the car, sometimes through mandatory uh, legislation, sometimes through consumers demanding it, sometimes through industry innovation. We dramatically changed the road and all the ways we make the road safer. And especially around alcohol, we dramatically changed the culture of drunk driving. And I would argue that compared to the 1930s, drivers probably aren't that different. We probably haven't done very much to address the driver. And so, and so really, this is the map for the food system and the map for your own wellness programs. You do need to address the consumer, but we need to address the product, what's actually available and what's around them, what they're eating. We need to address the environment, which is the cafeterias and the vending machines and the school lunch uh, uh, program and the restaurants and all that. And we need to address the culture. We need to get people to understand that just like they wouldn't take their kid out of their car seat for fun, or just like they wouldn't say to their kids, go ride your bike, no big deal, don't wear your bike helmet today, or go out in the sun for four hours and get burned, they realize that those little decisions add up that it's not okay to give kids gummy bears and hot dogs after a soccer game. It's not okay, right? There's healthier fun snacks you can give them. You can give them fruit, you can give them nuts, you can give them dark chocolate. There's a lot of things you can give them, but unhealthy food is, should, not be, should become culturally not okay. The same way that all of those other things that we do that affect the public's health are just culturally not, not, not only not, not okay, but at least not celebrated. At least we shouldn't be celebrating soda. Right? We shouldn't be celebrating bad food. So thank you so much for your attention. I want to highlight um, a, a, a recent article that I wrote just a few days ago. It's in a website called theconversation.com. It's about healthcare, but it really, you could take all of that and talk about worksite wellness. If you want to fix America's healthcare or worksite wellness, first focus on food. And there's my Twitter handle if people tweet. So uh, if we have a few minutes, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. How much time do we have? Just one question? Okay. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. So the question was, what, hear more about the worksite wellness program for weight loss that, that retrains the brain. Um, and uh, Sue Roberts, actually, the faculty member who developed that program is here, stand up, Sue. So I asked her to come. Yeah, this is Dr. Dr. Sue Roberts. So she uh, has spent about 20 years in her laboratory working on animal models to understand energy regulation and found, uh, and I borrowed her terminology, that about 80% of eating behavior is unconscious. And she's the one that gave me the example of holding your breath, right? It just doesn't work. And so she's developed a program over the last decade that uses, um, first, it, changes, it, it focuses on food composition that helps with, with brain reward. Um, and so there's several aspects of, of the quality of the food that help with brain reward. It uses things like familiarity. So you can't switch someone from hamburgers to kale, 
right? You have to switch them and take them along the spectrum from you know, regular pizza to whole grain pizza and so on. And it uses menus and other you know, established scientifically uh, 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 training methods to get people to, to target their unconscious brain and eating. No calorie counting, no willpower, and people on their her program lose about 15% of their weight in six months, and they have less cravings. Um, and so it's, and, and on functional MRI, she's done functional MRI to show that when you show people pictures of foods, their unconscious brain, the brain reward center or addiction center, lights up now for healthy foods and, and doesn't light up as much for unhealthy foods. So it's the first re, uh, study that ever has shown that you can actually retrain your brain, that we're not hardwired to prefer unhealthy foods. And for time, I'll end there. If people have questions, I'm happy to answer them here or, or uh, at, at our booth. And Dr. Roberts is also here. Thank you so much and for all that you're doing for wellness.